Salutations to the Truth Corps, whoever or wherever you may be on the planet. I'm sitting here in the corner of the studio on a very blustery winter night, listening to the wind pound at the house as it races over the hills in the mountain farmlands of a little fairy tale kingdom tucked between France and Portugal. And it feels like a moment to invite you for some light chatter. Chatter on my part, since I'm the one who's chattering and you're the one who's listening. I tend to take on some heavy subjects now and then. So let's say at this moment, this evening, I'll go a little lighter. In fact, I'll bring up something that's almost trivial to consider. What's that? Well, it's the intrinsic value of being human. Obviously, I can't see your faces right now. I can't see your body language either. So I have no way of knowing how you react to that phrase, the intrinsic value of being human. It is, after all, only a phrase, and as I say, a trivial one. But when you rephrase it, if you rephrase it, you can make it into a question or two. Is there an intrinsic value in being human? That's a question. And what is the intrinsic value of being human? How do you define it? How do you measure it? To what is it relative? You might take note that whenever we talk of values, value of any kind, a moral value, such as kindness, a monetary value, an artistic value, a philosophical or spiritual value. You know, I never use the word spiritual. It's worth taking note that values can be posited. It is a value to be kind, but they can only be defined and determined relative to something else. All values are relative to something. For instance, to take the crude example of the change in your pocket, the coins you might have in your pocket, they're only valuable relative to something, that is to say relative to what they can purchase. In themselves, they have no value, or they might be old coins, they might be Roman coins if you're a coin collector. And in that sense, they would be valuable relative to history, relative to the story that they tell by what they're made of and the figure that is printed on the coins. All values are relative to something. So, to what is the intrinsic value of being human relative? Or is it relative? Is it perhaps an absolute value? But what is an absolute value? If you were to define it as a value that is not relative to anything, but stands completely on its own terms, then you're stating a contradiction. No value whatsoever can stand solely on its own terms in isolation. It has to be defined and determined relative to something. We'll ponder on that for a while, just for a moment. <clears throat> 
And as you're letting that float in your mind, bring another part of your attention to the definition of humanity. Now, humanity basically can be defined in two ways. Humanity is a name for the human species. And so, within that framework, how do you define the characteristics of someone who is human? Well, there are three parameters. First is the genetics. All human beings, or human animals as I prefer to say, have the same genetic roots. And they are derived from a single species root into various races. Second characteristic is they have the same morphology. So human beings have a head, two arms, two legs, various organs, and they are identical throughout the entire species. The third characteristic is behavior. All human animals behave in similar ways, as well as in very different ways. There is a substratum of behavior which is completely similar. For instance, human animals are social. They like to congregate. They like to mingle. But the behavior, the specific behaviors of social activity in Brazil are different from those in Iceland or China or anywhere else. So human behaviors, customs and manners vary widely across the planet, but there are some innate or generic human behaviors that are common all over the world and common to all races and cultures. For instance, having meals together. The way human beings share meals is not the same in Africa as it is in Canada, but the activity of sharing meals is the same everywhere. So much for humanity by reference to the human species, but there's another connotation of the word humanity. For instance, when someone says to you, what's wrong with you? Where's your humanity? The connotation here is that humanity is not a biological and behavioral property, but it's a moral property. It's something that you feel emotionally, intuitively, about being human and about the presence of other human beings. So if you have humanity, then you exhibit this quality. But how do you define the characteristics of humanity in the second case? In the first case, it's easy to define them because they're generic and consistent. But how do you define the attributes of humanity as a moral property of human animals? To put it another way, let's say, let's assume, just assuming for a friend, that you are not merely a human animal due to a fact of birth from the genome, but that you have humanity. Ah, yes. Well, what's the evidence that you have humanity, that you have humane qualities? And there you get into a game that is entirely open. You can define it any way you like. You can say that the properties that are innately present in our humanity in the second sense could include anything. They do not merely include positive or acceptable, approvable behaviors such as kindness, 
generosity, respect, and gratitude, if you define those as humane attributes, then what about cruelty? What about hate? What about manipulation? These are human behaviors, and are they not also humane? Anything that human beings do, anything that they exhibit in their behavior is humane, whether it's positive or negative. So you don't really get anywhere, or it's difficult to get anywhere, grappling with this second concept of humanity. You can see that it's an open field. It has the values imputed to it which is strange because the assumption is that humaneness, the humanity in you, already has present in it a certain set of values. They are givens, but there are in fact no givens. Not really. What is humane is simply an imputation, an attribute that is posited but not an attribute that is essentially found. One of the principles of existentialism, in fact, the guideline by which existentialism is defined, is the old proposition, existence precedes essence. This is what Sartre said, famous saying, existence precedes essence. So if you apply that to the question of humanity and to the attributes of humaneness, what it tells you is that there is essentially nothing defined in your humaneness. What defines your humaneness is existential and not essential. It is whatever you demonstrate by your behavior as you exist in a particular moment and in a particular situation. So having reflected on all that for a moment, let's go back to the opening proposition. The intrinsic value of being human. Once again, I'll spin it around into a question. Is there intrinsic value in being human merely due to the fact of having been born into one of the human races? And if so, is that value universal? It's a double question, a double-barreled question. So now look around the world and what do you see? Well, as I've often noted, you don't actually ever see any human being, pure anthropine as such. You only see racial derivatives, you see? It's sort of like 57 flavors of ice cream. There are 57 flavors of ice cream, obviously, but there is no ice cream. So there are X number of races of the anthropine species on the planet, but there is no pure anthropine who does not belong to a race. Now, presumably, well, hold on a minute. I don't presume, or I try not to. It's part of my Gnostic practice. So let's just say I'm presuming for a friend. And my friend presumes that there is an intrinsic and innate value in every human animal of every race that you might encounter in the course of your life and in yourself as well, of course. So my friend goes a little further and presumes that this intrinsic value is given, doesn't have to be created, no one has to do anything to have it, it doesn't have to be earned. It's given, 
And my friend also presumes, hang on to your booties for this, that it's equal in everyone. So, every single human being, every person, has an intrinsic value simply by the fact of being born into one of the human races. That's the presumption. Have you ever heard of that presumption? Have, do you yourself entertain that presumption? Have you ever considered that that presumption might be wrong? That it might be just plain untrue? Now, before I take this little talk around to its screaming conclusion, and I am pedaling as fast as I can, I have to navigate around a tricky spot. I would describe it like this. There appears to be a presumption, according to my friend, that, how can I say this? It's quite amusing, really. That if I hold the view that there is an equal and intrinsic value in every human person, then that makes me look like a good human person. If I attribute that value to others unconditionally, then I also attribute it to myself. And so everybody's covered by the policy. And I can be regarded with approval oh, I'm a good person because I respect the equal and intrinsic value of all human beings based on the simple fact that they are born as human beings. Let's call that the humanitarian viewpoint. Needless to say, those tads in the world who like to present themselves as humanitarians hold that view, don't they? And if you don't hold that view unconditionally, well, there's a good chance that you might immediately be regarded as a bad person. That's the trick. That's the tricky spot. But I can get around that tricky spot really fast. I can dance around it on my tiptoes easily due to the fact that I don't give a slippery, slobbery, flying fuck if I'm perceived as a good person or not. And that being the case, I hold the position of exceptional freedom. And I can regard the question of the innate and equal value of all human beings with detachment. I'm not implicated. I don't care how anyone sees my view of it. I'm not adopting that view so that I can be regarded as a good person. So having made that clear, what am I doing here? Well, basically, my friends, I'm just opening the door to a really, really big space of freedom. The freedom not to be obligated to regard all people as having an equal and intrinsic value. But hold on, because it gets even better. Not only am I not obligated to view others in that way, but I'm not obligated to view myself in that way either. And so I don't. I don't view myself as a human individual who has an innate and equal value matching that of all others. I'm a long way from that, I can guarantee you. And once again, my friend is nudging me 
with his presumption and he's saying, well, John, what you're saying is pretty horrible. And don't you know, or don't you presume that even speaking in this way, even suggesting such things makes you look really bad. So you see, my friend is warning me in a friendly way, saying, be careful, because it's pretty safe to assume that if you continue talking in this matter, in this manner, on this matter, it can only get worse. Well, maybe so. In any case, I'm not going to develop this point extensively in this little talk. I'm merely introducing it. Like I said, I'm opening the doorway, so let's stand in the doorway together. And once again, following the practice of the living gnosis today, let's ask the appropriate question. There are a number of appropriate questions that come to mind, but here's one of them. Well, was it always that way? It's pretty clear that in the world today, there's a big issue about regarding all people of all races, all cultures, all walks of life, all religions, as having the same innate human value. It's pretty common today to think in that way or to be obligated to think in that way. But was that always so? Has it always been this way? That's the leading question. And I'm more or less going to leave you with that question. But I will suggest an answer. I will suggest a path of investigation and reflection. The flat answer and the short answer is no, absolutely not. You see, this notion of universality, the innate and intrinsic value that we are all equal, merely due to the fact that we are born human, is actually something that developed over time. And there were many places in the world and many cultures where that concept did not exist. It was entirely absent. Now, people who adapt that concept today and who endorse it and who regard others and measure others by whether or not they hold the same view, they tend to regard that principle of universality as being a high achievement of civilization. You see, the civilizations, they, they allow, they admit, they acknowledge that there were civilizations in the past, whole cultures that existed for centuries, who did not hold that view, who did not look upon themselves or other human animals in that way. But they say that was barbaric, that was uncivilized. And today we have reached the pinnacle of civilization and there are several characteristics that tell us we're at the pinnacle. One of them is, of course, our fabulous and fantastic elaborate technology that we have created and invented in recent years. So there are our concrete achievements, consider our concrete achievements, but there is the moral achievement. It's a great, great moral achievement. It's the pinnacle of moral rectitude to look at everyone and look at yourself and nod your head and say, yes, yes, all have the same value. Human life is to be valued in and of itself, essentially, not existentially. And that value stands in complete lack of relation to anything. 
How did those other cultures determine the value of a person, of a man or a woman, of a child, of an adult? They determined the value of that human person relative to various factors, mainly two factors. The first one was the conditions of birth. If someone was born into a slave situation, someone was born into a family of merchants, someone was born into the aristocracy, someone was born into the role of emperor, like Marcus Aurelius, who was emperor of the Roman Empire. And the second factor was performance, the way that that individual behaved. So, people were evaluated on those standards. There was no notion of regarding others unconditionally as having inherent value. Value was based on something. It was relative to those two concrete factors. The circumstances of birth, which used to be known as fate, and the evidence of performance, what that individual actually did. And there's a, the variations of these two factors are quite interesting. For instance, let's go back to the pagan era, era go back to, say, Greek and Roman civilization. At that time, you would be born into a certain class. Let's say that you were born into a merchant family. You belong to the merchant class. You have the attributes and qualities and values relative to the circumstances in which you're born. So let's say you're born into a family who trades in olives and you choose to become an olive trader and to follow the tradition of your family. So you accept your fate. You don't try to be something else other than what the cards show, the cards that life dealt you. You play the hand that is dealt you. Then comes the second factor, your performance. Well, how do you play it? Well, you can be a good merchant, a bad merchant, a generous merchant of olives. You can be uh, a crook. You can cheat and deceive your customers. You can swindle money from the company, you see, and take an emperor, take an emperor like Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius didn't choose to be the emperor of the Roman Empire. He was born into it. And then he behaved in a certain way. And you really ought to go learn a little about him and see how he behaved. Go read his meditations. It says a lot how he behaved and how he treated people. And one of the striking things you can learn from reading his meditations is that Marcus Aurelius treated people equally, but he did not consider them to be equal. There's a difference between treating people equally and supposing or presuming that they all have an innate, intrinsic, and unconditional value. For instance, if I have a hardware store, which I've inherited from my grandparents and my parents, and I run the hardware store, people come in to buy tools, and I treat all the customers equally but I obviously do not consider them all to be equals. So if someone comes in and I can see that they don't know how to use a power saw, I would be very careful in selling them a power saw and I would talk to them about it first. But if a workman I know in the community who builds houses, who knows how to use tools, comes in to buy a power saw, then I treat him differently. 
Now that might sound like a contradiction because I said, didn't I, that I treat all the customers equally. Well, you know what, you know what I mean by that. It's common sense. You know, I regard them, I respect them as customers. I serve them as best I can. I give them equal attention. But I also can perceive the performance of the customer. I can perceive their abilities. And so I treat them differently and I advise them differently about their purchase depending on their abilities. So you see these two factors always come into play. Your fate, the throw of the dice, the class and conditions into which you are born, and the way you perform. Marcus Aurelius, as I mentioned, presents a really rich lesson in what I'm describing here. The way that he performed his duties as emperor is quite amazing. And so he was a noble, fair, and competent emperor. But there were also bad emperors. There were evil emperors. Others who were born into that role performed badly, by which I mean they inflicted harm and suffering unnecessarily. Also, finally, in looking at what might be called the profile of evaluating another human being, you can add the third factor, which is genetics. So certainly, you're born with a certain kind of genetics, again, the throw of the dice, and you may be not so smart, you may be of mediocre intelligence, you may be exceptionally smart, you may be exceptionally good at something like music, so you're born with musical talent. And that factor comes into play as well. And one thing that is really, really clear on the evidence, when you look at the variety of human beings, is the difference in your genetic endowment. No, people are not born equals. There is no equality. That's what makes it interesting. Now, people can be treated as equals, as I explained before, within certain circumstances. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't imply, and it certainly doesn't obligate you to regard them as equals. There is no equality. There is no uniform intrinsic equal value in the human races. The experiment doesn't work that way. Difference is real. Separation is an illusion. That's a metaphysical question. But difference is real. And difference is what makes it work. Difference drives the human experiment toward excellence. So finally, something comes to mind that I would be wise to point out before I conclude. I use the word difference. Is that the same as the word diversity? Does it seem like I'm making an argument for diversity? Absolutely not. See, the word diversity as it's used today in the Marxist sense, in political correctness, is a deceitful term. It doesn't mean allowing or accepting many different types of people who are unequal to be together, say, in a workplace or in a community. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that diverse peoples ought to be all considered equal. That's what it really means. So the lie of equality is contained in the plea for diversity. And of course, as you know, 
the hidden agenda of diversity is simply to mix all the colors of the rainbow into a muddy brown and eliminate white because, well, white is not a color. So your refrigerator doesn't have a color. Snow doesn't have a color. Clouds don't have a color, do they? That's diversity. The elimination of white and the treatment of all other colors as if they are equal. So I'm not arguing for diversity, obviously, but I will point out in conclusion that those who promote this idea that there is an intrinsic value in being human and you must recognize it according to the UN Declaration of Human Rights are the same who promote diversity. And they are also the same who are currently ruining the world with their plan for a dystopian future. So you might be well advised to look and see that great beacon of hope, that great beacon of humanitarian idealism that shines over the dystopian landscape. But don't be hypnotized by looking at that beacon as so many are and in their hypnotic state, they utterly fail to see the destruction being waged in the name of universal equality and the intrinsic value of being human. Enough said, and I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.